Naval Academy Museum presents a history of the Navy in 100 objects. This week we are looking at the early days of the U.S. Navy, back when it was still fully under sail. The launch of the first U.S. steamship occurred in the same decade, but steam would not rise fully into prominence until several decades later. Therefore, at the time, wind ruled supreme. Except when there wasn't any. Well, more of that on later. In his book, A Few Decades Later, The Influence of Sea Power Upon History, Alfred Thayer Mahan in the 1880s discussed this very problem, among others. In the beginning, he discussed the evolutionary learning process the U.S. Navy was undergoing during his time as it transitioned from sail to steam. And he begins an analysis by returning to the only other time that ships were not solely dependent on steam power, the days of the man-powered galleys used during the times of Alexander, Hannibal, and Caesar. Today, we are talking about what happens when you run out of wind. Specifically, what would happen when you ran out of wind 200 years ago, perhaps in the midst of combat. In many cases, it's very similar to what would happen today if a ship or boat were to run out of fuel. You would simply stop and drift at the mercy of whatever currents existed at the time. Our object today, and the ingenious method in which it was used on multiple occasions, demonstrates a novel approach to dealing with this problem, but also serves as a good reminder that someday our own current fuel sources may once again run out, and that we would be well served to continue learning and developing new technologies and cleaner, better, and more affordable ones. Who knows, maybe we will once again make the shift from steam power back to wind. We move now to the Naval Academy Museum with Dr. Scott Harmon, the director. Welcome, I'm Dr. Scott Harmon. We are at the Naval Academy Museum for another one of our series of podcasts on the U.S. Navy in 100 objects from the Naval Academy Museum. This time, I want to talk about one of the objects that I think is really interesting here, and that is the sea anchor you see above me uh, hanging from the ceiling. Uh, it looks like, uh, in my mind, the Jolly Green Giant's umbrella. Uh, it has a canvas around it stretched by the arms, and a sea anchor is usually used in a storm to keep the ship's bow uh, into the wind and waves so it rides more easily. Uh, this time it had a very different uh, uh, use. At the beginning of the War of 1812, the USS Constitution was here in Annapolis uh, getting the rest of her crew on board, getting her supplies. Uh, the captain of the Constitution was uh, Captain Isaac Hull, who had orders to join uh, Commodore John Rogers' uh, squadron to go out and chase a British merchant convoy. Well, the Constitution was a little late getting underway. Uh, finally got uh, her anchor up, uh, sailed down the Chesapeake Bay and at the Virginia Capes, made a left turn and was sailing up the coast off New Jersey. A number of sails were seen on the horizon. Uh, initially, uh, Captain Hull thought this might be the American squadron and uh, started sailing north uh, to meet them. The other ships, likewise, turned south to meet up with Hull. As they got closer and closer, Hull realized that this was not an American squadron and he did an about face to try and get away. About that time, the wind dies. And the way you move a 1,500-ton ship without an engine and without wind to blow on the sails is to put men in boats out in front of the ship and tow it. This is a very difficult task. Somebody on board the Constitution had another idea. Let's use the sea anchor to help in this. It is very common uh, for ships to do what is called kedging, taking a light anchor out in front of the ship, dropping it, and then pulling the ship up to it using the ship's capstan. This time, instead of a regular anchor, they used the sea anchor, spliced together a half mile or mile long length of line, took that out in front of the ship, dropped it in the water, and brought the other end back on board around the capstan, and the crew walked around the capstan, winching the ship up to the sea anchor at the same time the men in the boats are trying to pull the ship away. In variable winds over the next three days, Constitution gradually drew away. Uh, she had had to fire her guns at some cases. But on about the third day of this uh, long exercise, 
Hull noticed a storm coming up over the horizon. He had all his sails set, which would be a very dangerous thing if this is a sharp squall, could dismast the ship, which you don't want at the time when the enemy is pursuing you. So he furled all his sails. The British, uh, seeing what Hull was doing, and also worrying about the, the storm coming up, furled all their sails. The squall hit as soon as the heavy wind uh, had subsided and uh, the British were blinded to what Hull was doing. He set all sails and got over the horizon to get away from the British. Uh, in this process, uh, it was the custom trying to lighten the ship as much as possible. One of the things they get rid of is any excess drinking water that weighs a lot. Uh, they might get rid of cannonballs, anything that is not necessary at the moment in order to get away the, from the enemy. I'm sure one of the things they did not get rid of was the rum ration for each of the crew members. Uh, that uh, would have been devastating to the crew. This was very important to their lives. Uh, but when Hull got back, uh, he sailed into Boston, uh, rapidly got uh, his ship refitted, replenished, no stores on board, got underway about uh, the 1st of August, 1812, and a couple of days later met uh, the HMS Guerriere uh, in battle, and this was the first victory of an American frigate over a British frigate in the War of 1812. We hope that you'll come to the museum and see these wonderful objects for yourself. Uh, pay us a visit. Uh, these are really exciting and important uh, objects in this series. Thank you. That was Dr. Scott Harmon, the director of the museum, tying us in to some of the novel uses and novel ways that the sea anchor would help with the problem of no wind. The Constitution today is actually still a commissioned warship in the U.S. Navy. It is staffed and manned by active duty U.S. Navy sailors, and just like a Navy aircraft carrier or a Navy destroyer on operational duty, it too is considered a warship on operational duty today can be found on display in Boston where the staff gives tours and demonstrations. And you can find out a lot more about it as well as see some of the images from this series on our website if you're listening in on audio. Thank you for joining us. We hope to hear from you and see you next week.